Do you have a paranormal encounter you'd like to share with us? Send us an email with your story for a chance of it being featured on Weird World. Martin was holidaying at his summer place in southern Italy. Actually, an ancient tower which was still livable on a remote part of the coast. His friend Holger, a Scandinavian artist who sometimes visited, was staying with him and they had just dined at sunset on the top platform of the tower. Holger lit his pipe and Martin could see that he was staring at a spot in the gorge below. Martin knew the spot well and it was a long time before his friend spoke. Martin also guessed what was coming as Holger asked him if he could see a little mound next to a boulder, which to him looked like a grave. The strange thing was, Holger continued, that the body seemed to be lying on top of it. He concluded that it must be an effect of the light, as firstly it would not be a grave, and secondly, if it were, the body would be inside, not outside. Martin agreed, but went on to tell Holger that it really was a grave. Holger was incredulous, although Martin assured him that in the moonlight there always seemed to be the outline of the body on top. Holger decided to go down and take a look at it, and Martin watched as he approached the mysterious mound and walked around it. He had reached the spot where the thing ceased to be visible. Holger went on until he was able to stand on top of the mound. Martin could still see the thing, but it was no longer lying down. It was on its knees now, winding its white arms around Holger's body and looking up into his face. A cool breeze arose like a breath from another world, while the thing seemed to be trying to climb to its feet using Holger's body. He stood upright quite unconscious of it, as Martin shouted to him to come back. Holger seemed to step with difficulty from the mound, the thing's arms still around his waist, but its feet unable to leave the grave. As Holger came slowly forward, it was drawn and lengthened like a wreath of mist, thin and white, until Martin saw him shake himself as if chilled. At the same instant, a small wail of pain came to Martin on the breeze, and the misty presence floated swiftly back and lay once more at its length on the mound. Martin shuddered as he remembered having done the same thing as his friend, and now knew that those white misty arms had also been around him when he had also heard the cry of the thing and resisted a temptation to look back. On his return, Holger said that he had also wanted to turn around and look, that it had been an effort not to. Martin told him the story about the grave and its origin. An old man called Alario had been living in the village beyond the hill. He had made a fortune selling sham jewellery in South America and escaped with his gains when he was found out. He at once started to enlarge his house and had to bring two masons from Paola for the job. A rough pair of scoundrels whose board and lodging in his house was part of their pay. Alario's wife was dead and he only had his son Angelo, a much better sort than himself, who was to marry the daughter of the richest man in the village. Although the marriage was arranged, the young people were said to be in love with each other. In fact, Angelo was admired by all the women in the village, including one wild but beautiful woman called Christina. She had no regular means of subsistence, but was willing to perform any chores for food and a place to sleep, and often helped in the house of Angelo's father. When Alario fell ill with a fever, Christina was sent to Scalia to fetch a doctor quite late in the afternoon. While she was gone, Alario's condition worsened, and finally a priest was brought to his bedside to administer last rites. Overcome by their horror of death, all those attending him fled, including the servant who had nursed the sick man. At that time, Angelo was away, and within five minutes, the two masons had crept into the dead man's room, seized the heavy iron-bound box under his bed, and left the village under cover of darkness. 
Wanting to hide the box, they dug their hole in the gorge close to the boulder, where the mound is now. Christina had not been able to bring the doctor from Scalia as he was away on another visit, and she returned by a shortcut which brought her near to where the two men were digging. She instantly understood the situation, and for their own safety, the men dispatched her and quickly buried her with the ironbound chest. They returned immediately to the village before the absence was noticed. Only twenty minutes had passed when Alario's servant returned with two other women to prepare his body for burial. She saw at a glance that his chest was gone from under the bed and that it had been stolen in the short interval since she had left the room. All she could do was scream out in the street. There were no carabineers in the village. Angelo's future father-in-law accused the two stonemasons of theft, but they made a dramatic escape in the dark. Angelo was now a pauper, and his wedding would not take place. In that part of the world, at that time, marriages were arranged on business principles. It was several days before Christina was missed, and then assumed to have connived and fled with the masons. As Martin paused in his telling, the outline of the thing on the mound was clearer to their eyes. Martin continued that, now poor and shunned in the village, Angelo became solitary and morose. In his lonely twilight hours, he began to have strange waking dreams, when a barefoot woman noiselessly approached and beckoned to him without speaking. She would smile lovingly, showing two small, sharp teeth. He knew that she was Christina, and he knew that she was dead, but her apparition did not scare him. Soon she always appeared after sunset, her deep and hungry eyes feasting on his soul and casting a spell over him. One morning he found himself asleep and alone on the mound, and in a panic fled back to his house, back to hoeing his small field and a normal life. He promised himself to always go home without lingering by the gorge. However, he was unable to resist another night with the mysterious being as his wild dream sped on through twilight, darkness and moonlight. In the chilly dawn he again awoke half dead upon the mound, drained of his blood but strangely longing to give more. Night after night he could not resist meeting Christina as he became weaker and lost his strength to work in his field. Martin then told of the experience of Antonio, the man who usually stays at his tower as caretaker. He had returned one evening from visiting his people near Salerno, and was very tired, but found himself awaking just after midnight. He looked out towards the mound, saw something, and did not sleep again that night. The next morning he observed that there was nothing on the mound but loose stones and sand, but did not go near it and went straight to the house of the old priest in the village. He told the priest that he had seen an evil thing the night before, how the dead drink the blood of the living. He asked him to bring his book and holy water to him at sunset. He would be carrying his pick. The priest had read in books of strange beings, neither quick nor dead, who lie ever fresh in their graves, stealing out in the dusk to taste life and blood. Antonio went twice in the bright sunlight to look at the mound and search for a hole through which the being could get out, but found none. As the sun began to sink, the priest came, and in the grey lingering light they saw two figures a man's that walked, and a woman's that flitted beside him. While her head lay on his shoulder, she kissed his throat. The vision passed the two terrified men and disappeared into the shadow. Both trembling, they approached the mound where their lantern revealed Angelo's white face, unconscious as if in sleep, a thin red line of his blood trickling from his upturned throat down into his collar. Another face looked up from its feast, with two deep dead eyes and red parted lips showing two gleaming teeth on which glistened a rosy drop. 
As the priest showered holy water, Antonio raised his pick. A cry rang out, and the thing was gone. But as they dug the grave, there seemed to be some kind of violent struggle, when suddenly an iron-bound box was thrown up and rolled onto the ground beside them. So finally, Angelo received his inheritance, but he did not stay around to marry his betrothed. He was badly frightened, went to South America, and had not been heard of since. The spirit of poor Christina had helped him to obtain his entitlement, but remained unmourned and forever tied to that stony mound.